Before we start, uh, you will have uh, seen this program run down here. So today will be a full day of work and enjoyment, of course. <laughs> yeah, because Professor Haley has a lot of experience in teaching and learning, and he himself actually is a self learner. He didn't study for any education degree, and his background is geography. So you can see, um, after the opening remark, it will be his workshop, and it will last about three hours, and then we're going to have lunch just next door, all right? So it's our favorite place, and it will be... Okay, so two workshops. Um, first one, uh, very much about engaging students in research and inquiry, um, and those are some of the, the topics we'll be dealing with. we will start there with the, the quote. This is not a, a new idea. This comes from Humboldt with the foundation foundation of the University of Berlin in 1810, uh, <coughs> where he said that universities should treat learning as not yet wholly solved problems and hence always in research mode. For me, that I think really describes still what, a high, what higher education or the university is about. It's what distinguishes universities from other forms of education. It's that provisionality of knowledge, that uncertainty of knowledge, uh, which really uh, is core to us. So, one of the themes uh, under develop is uh, the way in which um, uh, students see research uh, in an institution. And there are really two different approaches to it. There's one where uh, they get involved in doing research, but it's what I call the elite model. It's for selected students, uh, students we often see as the sort of high-flying students, people who be like us uh, in many ways, who we encourage to do and we'll work on research projects with us. Um, they may then go to an undergraduate research conference, very common in the States, but uh, uh, spreading uh, around the world. We picked up the idea, um, set up a British conference in undergraduate research about seven or eight years ago now. Um, and then about five years ago, we started for an even more elite group uh, on something called Posters in Parliament, uh, where 20 to 40 students were invited to bring a poster, uh, display it in Parliament, and then members of Parliament uh, were invited to, to come and, and celebrate it. Um, and then we judged which was the best poster. That particular year, I was one of the judges. Um, the person standing next to me is Phil Levy, uh, and her name will occur uh, a little later as, uh, as well. But that's the elite model. That's for students who are going on, but probably, you know, well, to test out whether they want to go and do a master's and do a PhD and maybe start an academic life themselves in some cases. Great, and you need that. Uh, very important. But the model I'm much more likely to talk about, <coughs> most of my examples are going to be what I call the mainstreaming model, where we make research and inquiry available for all our students. Um, and this is a statement Alan and I uh, made. It's, it's quite quoted. Um, it, that all undergraduate students in all higher education institutions should experience learning through and about research and inquiry. And the only way you can do that is to build it into the curriculum, to give them the opportunity uh, for that. So there is two different models, and I wanted to make that clear at the beginning, because often there's a, there's a lot of cross-talking. You know, somebody's talking about the elite model, and, uh, and another person's talking about the, the inclusive model, uh, and uh, uh, which model is very important to what is possible to do and what your views are, are uh, about it. So bear in mind those two different ones, but we're going to largely concentrate on the second one. Uh, um, I'll let you read that quote from Angela Brew. Previous slide as well, we missed out. I mentioned you want the title, so it's simply our, our argument. <laughs> but, uh, Angela, in that quote, is actually expressing it in a different uh, way, but it's very much the same idea. Um, uh, and I think what is critical is that getting students involved in research and inquiry is not just for those who are going to go on to make a career in that, it's for all our students. Uh, it's a, the skills you gain from being involved in research and inquiry are just the same skills you require to just be a professional in the 21st century, whatever that profession is. So it's, it should be available for all students. That's really the argument uh, uh, that we're putting there. Um, Angela Bruce, she's British but been working in Australia for over 20 years. She actually started the Australian Conference in Undergraduate Research. Um, uh, Another quote here, this is from the States, David Hodge, used to be the president of Miami University. Um, those who I know a couple of people in the States will probably know that Miami University is not where the rest of you might expect it, but it's actually in Ohio. <laughs> um, and David Hodge, when he joined the institution, he came with the idea of setting up 
what do you call a student of scholar model. Um, uh, Miami were already doing lots of innovative things um, uh, 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 there, but he wanted to embed it right from, the, from day one. And he developed what he called a top 25 project, where a identified uh, top, a bit of a misnomer, these were the largest recruiting courses, usually about 200, 300 plus students, mainly uh, first year courses, some uh, um, uh, sophomore courses uh, as well. Um, and uh, he took a bit of a risk because he um, provided 35,000 US dollars to convert each of those courses uh, into an inquiry-based learning course. Um, now, as you've done inquiry-based learning, um, I'll know that's you know, relatively easy if you've got 20 or 50 students, but when you're talking about several hundred, it's more of a challenge. Um, uh, uh, and there were, I think, about 31 courses they actually did at the end of the day, so it wasn't a very good title, but it, it, seemed, it, it got known as the top 25 project. Um, and they did some research uh, uh, on it before and after, and the research which really impressed me was what we might call time on task. Uh, the students going through the revised courses um, uh, were spending uh, anything about between a quarter and a third more time to get the same learning outcomes at the end. Um, that caused a bit of a friction at the beginning because they said, you know, my friend who took this course last year didn't have to work anything like as hard as I did. Um, now it's just accepted what they do. And as you know, that the more time you spend, the more effort you put in, you generally get better results. Um, and that's what's happening here. They des designed a curriculum uh, where to get out at the other end, you'd had to learn something. <laughs> um, and time on task was just one measure of that. Uh, and that, I think, is you know, something we're all trying to do, design our courses so that students learn as, as a result. And um, uh, this is certainly what happened uh, in their course. And um, over 25% of the students will have taken uh, uh, at least one of those uh, um, top courses. Um, and so that changes the culture and it means they can move on uh, and uh, uh, do different things in subsequent years. So this is what I want to uh, frame on different ways of engaging students, and we've talked a little bit about that. Uh, then I've chosen specifically some examples from the subjects that you teach here. Um, uh, so the art, social sciences, business uh, uh, in particular. Before we'll uh, stand back and look at uh, a slightly wider range of courses, um, but uh, organise this time what you might do at the, right at the beginning on sort of day one of entry, and then right at the end, the sort of capstone uh, area. Um, put it in the context of the developmental journey that the students have. Uh, talk a little bit about supervising and assessing projects and a bit of action planning at the end. So quite a lot we're trying to get through uh, in the time uh, uh, available. Um, so I've already referred to those two different models, an elite and a uh, um, sort of mainstreaming integrated model. These are terms which are used around the world in different institutions. Um, and every institution wants to do something different. They want their unique selling point. So they come up with a different title. Uh, but they're largely, uh, and I've been to all those institutions, uh, they're largely doing very similar things with slight you know, degrees of emphasis you know, to give their own uh, context. So for example, the University of Sydney there, uh, the fourth one down, um, they came up with the term re research enriched learning and teaching, uh, RELT. Um, and they came up with that simply because they couldn't find anybody else who actually used that term. So they said, you are unique. Come to Sydney and you'll have, you'll have RELT. Um, I was actually the keynote speaker at the launch of that. Uh, but I talked just about the same examples, that I'll, uh, you know, some examples I'll talk to you today uh, about. Um, uh, and other places around the world using different language but describing very similar things. Uh, so different terms there. Uh, I will make these slides available, by the way, um, uh, uh, to Eugenia and they can get uh, circulated. Carol will probably uh, do that uh, um, uh, uh, around. Um, and also language uh, will pick up the difference between capstone projects and dissertations. Again, two, uh, quite a lot of overlap, but some distinctions there. Um, but the, the commonality is that the students in, in various forms are doing projects at the end of their course. Um, uh, uh, they may have slightly different purposes, and some may be group projects, or, and others will be individual. But we'll pick up that terminology as well later on. Okay, I'm going to start with an exercise. Anyone done a lineup before? 
Yeah, you, I'm surprised if you hadn't, Eugene. This is a, <laughs> quite a standard one in educational development. This is one I did in British Columbia several years ago. Um, what I'm going to do is, is put a statement on the screen. Um, and rather than ask you, you know, do you agree with it or disagree with it, I'm actually going to ask you to stand up and stand where you, uh, you know, the extent to which you agree or disagree. And that, you, that means you have to commit yourself to a particular place. And it's really an icebreaker. I use it quite a lot. Um, and wherever you happen to be standing, I want you then to talk to the person who's closest to you. Um, and you just have a comment, why are you standing here? What's your take on, the, on that statement? Now, I suspect quite a lot of you may have a similar view on this. So I'm going to challenge one or two of you, perhaps, to be, play devil's advocate uh, and take a, a view you might not actually agree, but just to, to make the argument uh, uh, you know, for that. Um, so statement, it, you've already heard it, because I've actually told you what my view is, that all undergraduate students uh, in this case at Lingham, uh, we'll, we'll, make it, we'll make it specific to here, should experience learning through and about research and inquiry. Um, now, strongly agree, I'd like you to stand over this way, strongly disagree over there, and I hope some people will, 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 will go over there just to, so we have a, a, a bit of a discussion. Um, but can you stay in the room, please? <laughs> so I invite you to... Okay. Why I like that exercise, and I use it a lot, but with different statements, and that's not a particularly good statement to it because it's um, uh, uh, one where uh, actually quite a lot of people you know, tend to be at one end of the spectrum. But if you can get them where it's a fairly ambiguous statement, and there is ambiguity there as we began to tease out with the words all and the words research, um, that's the great thing because it, it surfaces a lot of the issues which uh, you know, come up and we'll be exploring uh, 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 more as we go on. Um, so I encourage you, if you haven't tried it, try it with, that, with your students as well. Um, okay, how many of you have seen that model before you got the handout? Anybody seen that one before? All right. Um, <coughs> another uh, dozen people or so can convert to it. <laughs> um, I'm actually known around the world for this model. <laughs> it's uh, uh, what, I'm, uh, what I'm known for. It's going to be on my grave, I think, when I uh, <laughs> uh, uh, eventually go. Um, it's been more cited, more reproduced than anything else that I've uh, done in over 40 years in higher education. So my impact on 40 years ahead is one diagram. <laughs> so better than nothing. <laughs> Um, uh, and actually, I, I pinched quite a lot of those ideas from a colleague, uh, Ron Griffiths at the University of West of England. Um, I was been invited to uh, contribute a chapter to a book uh, uh, being edited. Do come and join us, please. Uh, you know, that's, uh, <laughs> join over the table there, sir. You know. <laughs> um, uh, I got a, a pre-publication copy of an article he was um, uh, write, uh, had written. Um, and I'd been asked to write this chapter, and I was uh, uh, trying to get a framework for the chapter and mulling over. Um, and he came up with three terms that he suggested we, we used rather more systematically. Um, and uh, I ended up with a diagram for it. I get more cited for it now than he does, and I give him full credit uh, for it. And it, just, it did teach me something, that if you can put things into diagrams, people tend to remember those better than simply on text. Uh, um, uh, uh, and I do quite a lot of you know, two-by-two two diagrams. They're, they're simple, but they are memorable. Um, uh, uh, and it's a good way of summarizing a lot of information. Really, all it is is just identifying four different ways in which students come across research. Um, and it's no more than really a classification. Uh, if you look at the axes, uh, top is students as participants, at the bottom students frequently in audience, and from left to right the emphasis is on the research content or on the, the processes, the problems. Uh, those are the axes. Uh, Ron suggested we use the term research-led when we were talking about the subject matter of the research. Uh, uh, what you would teach in your course is about economics, about English, about law, whatever the subject happens uh, uh, to be. Clearly very much on the left-hand side of, of the diagram. I put it in the bottom half because in most institutions, the most common way that students get that information uh, is in a lecture. Um, and most lectures tend to be fairly passive. It's you know, me talking at you. Uh, but they can be, as we'll talk a, a lot this afternoon, be quite active as well. But um, students are largely the audience in it. Research-oriented, Ron suggested, we use when we're talking about the methods and techniques of teaching a particular subject, the processes, thinking like an economist, uh, uh, like a, uh, a humanities uh, a scholar, um, uh, like a scientist. Um, clearly now on the right-hand side, much more debatable whether top or bottom, uh, uh, because there are numerous different ways that we teach methods and techniques. 
But again, it's quite common, particularly in the larger institutions, to have a, uh, a core second or third level uh, uh, course, even entitled Research Methods and Techniques in X, whatever the subject happens to be, and it's a lecture with 300 students in there, and then afterwards you put them into practical groups or into uh, uh, seminar groups, depending on what the subject matter is, to explore those in more detail. Research based, Ron said, well, let's use that term when we're talking about the students actually doing some research and inquiry. Uh, they're undertaking some research and inquiry. That's where all the terms like inquiry based learning, problem based learning, project based learning, team based learning, X based learning, just fill in the word X, uh, uh, you know, fit. It's where the students are actually doing uh, some of it. It's a learning by doing. Uh, uh, approach. Clearly, they, they're very active, they're the participants, and it's what they're largely doing uh, is the processes of learning how to take uh, uh, on research. The emphasis is on the processes and problems. I had a gap in the diagram then. Ron didn't have a term in the top left somewhere. One little contribution there, I came up with the word research tutored, and that's where I say is we do a learning through discussion. Um, the ideal one is the one-to-one -one relationship you have you know, in the supervising, uh, maybe with a senior undergraduate doing a, uh, a project, but it certainly would be a PhD student or something like that, you'd have that one-to-one -one relationship with. A great way of learning. Um, uh, but it can equally be in a class of 500 where you've uh, outlined uh, some ideas and you've challenged them, then you ask them to turn to their neighbour, talk about something for a few minutes, and then you invite a few people to comment back. Very much how we're running this workshop. Um, uh, uh, I, I give you an exercise, you feedback, I feedback on your feedback. We're learning together through uh, some form of discussion. So just four different ways uh, uh, which students will come across research. If you teach, you do all those things. Um, so it's not a matter of do we link our teaching and research. We all do in those ways um, uh, uh, if we're a teacher. Can I just check, is everybody a teacher here? Because is anyone coming from a service department? Uh, game? Are you a teacher or not? Do you teach subjects? Yes. You do. Fine. I was just checking everybody. We, we do. Fine. No, I was told last night that there might be a couple of people from the service department who weren't actually yeah, uh, teaching. Haven't they haven't come. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they may or may not join us. Um, I want to be inclusive. That's, uh, yeah, uh, uh, oh. um, so where that diagram has been used and where it's been useful is, is actually as sort of uh, doing a mini audit. Think of a session that you're running, a two, three hour session that you're running. What proportion of time in that two or three hours do students spend in the, in the boxes? Look at your semester course. Over the whole semester, what proportion of time do they split there? Look at the whole program a student might uh, do over four years and roughly what proportion. You, you won't get exact figures, you know, how do you measure them, but you get a, a, a feeling. And if you team teach, or you're, you're particularly at program level, it's a great thing if you're going to do, reorganize a course to start with that question and say, what are we doing currently? And is that an appropriate balance given the outcomes we want to uh, uh, get for our students? Um, and you may say, no, we, 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 given our outcomes, we need to shift that balance. And that gives you a way of starting a, a conversation and having a community. You know, and you're likely to disagree with your colleagues, but that's the nature of these uh, things. It's bringing it out in the open, uh, uh, and that's how it's largely been used uh, uh, and seen to be most valuable. <coughs> Any questions on that, that diagram? Oh, fairly straightforward. I think the one thing I would like to ask is that I might be challenged by the students why they have to do research for undergraduate. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, even when you're taking the very first course in the, in the first year, yeah. you are summarising research which has been done to them. They are coming across <coughs> research there. Uh, it's other people who have done that research rather than that. It's only when you get into uh, this one where they're actually doing the research themselves. Here it's, it's more, you know, the, your conventional lecture is going to be evidence-based based on it, and there will be some references you, you may ask some of the students to do. Or if you do a flipped classroom model, you may ask them to, you know, read one or two things before they come uh, into, to the class. So they're coming across it in different ways. Um, it's very inclusive in terms of it. It's not all the doing of it. Um, what sometimes people say is, do we start here in the first year and gradually move by the final year here? So the balance changes uh, as, you, as you move. That's one possibility. I would actually argue against it. I like variety, and I think there should be variety uh, at all levels. And so I'd want some research-based teaching right from day one in the first year, and we'll look at some first-year courses doing that. People argue against that sometimes and say, our students can't do that because they don't have the, the mathematical skills or the, uh, uh, that. Um, but that's treating students as empty vessels where you have to fill them up at least halfway before they can do anything interesting. 
and it's a very common statement I get at workshops, I say, well, you can do some of that filling up by actually getting the students to learn about it for themselves. Um, uh, so you use it as a, just one method of, of teaching alongside many other uh, methods. Um, so generally speaking, nearly all the examples we'll be looking at are in the top half of the diagram, and particularly in, 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 in that area. Um, uh, uh, but I'm not saying we all, everything should be in that area. I'm just saying, generally in higher education, um, I think too much of higher education is in the bottom half, uh, and we need to shift higher education more to the top half. And there's lots of research evidence to back that up in terms of the depth of learning, uh, uh, the retention of learning. Um, uh, yeah. But I don't want to throw out lectures. You know, I think they have a role to play. But I think we often use lectures for the wrong thing. We often use lectures to transmit knowledge. Um, and we think we've covered it because we can tick it off. I have talked for 20 minutes on that subject. Tick. Like that. Doesn't mean the students have actually learnt that much from it. Um, uh, and uh, I think le the key thing of a lecture is actually a stimulation. It's a motivation. Uh, yeah, that's where I think is the main function. And I think we sometimes over rely on lectures, and I'm just as guilty of that as my colleagues. I'm not uh, trying to preach something here. Um, uh, but um, you know, maybe one lecture uh, you know, a fortnight is sufficient, and we find other ways of that. But use that as a stimulation of ideas. They might not take any notes, but we've all been to that sort of lecture where we've come out buzzing with ideas. That's really the one you want. You want. Motivation is the, is, the, is the key element. Um, but that's perhaps a slightly different conversation we need to have. So I've been talking too long already. Let's jump into some examples here. And I deliberately chose them in subjects which I know uh, are taught here. Um, so I've taken examples from the arts, social science, and business. 11 different examples, pages 2 to 6, I think, of the handout, if I remember correctly. And um, what I want you to do is uh, you're only going to have time. Uh, some of you may have already you know, skim read them. But what I want you to do now is choose at least one example which you'll skim read now. But could you choose an, an example which is different to the other people on your table? Mm -hmm. So at least on your table, you're looking at some uh, different examples. And hopefully between us, we'll cover most of those. Um, and the idea of, of them, and this will be common to most exercises I do, is you'll skim read something, and you're trying to pick up something that you could find useful and maybe apply in your context. Mm -hmm. Now, if you start reading it, and it's boring, and that, Life's too short. Find another example. <laughs> um, but you're only going to have a, it's a skim read, not a very detailed read. Try to pinch one or two ideas which you might think applicable. And I'll ask, uh, you'll first have a little brief discussion at your table. But when everyone, I'm sure everybody has, has read something, I'll bring us all back together because we're a small group. And what I'll, the question I'll ask then, so I'll pre-warn you, is tell me something interesting that you've read. Uh, uh, from those, or tell me something interesting you do which applies to those yourselves. We won't be restricted to the examples. So is the exercise clear? Quick skim read. Your task is to find something interesting that you, you think might be applicable with some modification to your context. So I want to explore this in, in a way. And this comes from a diagram by Philippa Levy, whose photograph you saw earlier. The, she used to run a centre for inquiry-based learning in arts and social sciences at the University of Sheffield. Um, uh, at the same time, I had a centre for active learning at the University of Gloucestershire. We were both interested in, in inquiry-based learning. She comes from a, uh, a librarian background, um, uh, and very much interested in information science. Um, and uh, I've summarised her diagram. I've switched around a little bit. But you'll see the vertical axis is very similar to the uh, one in the earlier diagram. Mm -hmm. The horizontal one is different, and that's what I want to focus on. Uh, and I'm not going to unpack the four boxes there. You, if you're interested, you can look at uh, her, her articles. Um, but what she's doing on the horizontal one, at the right-hand end, she said, students participating in building knowledge. Mm -hmm. That is what we do as researchers. We are creating new knowledge, new understandings, uh, um, uh, which are new for society. If you want to get a, a publication, an internationally refereed publication, the critical thing is, what are you contributing which is new in some form? New to knowledge, new to understanding, continuing a debate that's going on currently uh, uh, and, you know, with it, a variety of ways in which we could do that. But that's the acid test, is what are you contributing which hasn't been you know, covered you know, before and moving the, the, the debate on. Some of our students, and I'm talking about undergraduates here, can operate at that level. And they can do work which is contributing to new knowledge for society. My general argument is I think more students can do that than we give credence to. The biggest barrier that I've come across for undergraduates doing this is us. 
that we don't believe they have the skills or the ability to do it. You say, no, wait till you're, you're, you're a postgraduate. That's a master's level thing. We actually stop them. I've got plenty of examples now, even of first-year students who can operate at that level and actually ended up with their name, along with uh, their tutors and that, on an international referee publication. They're exceptions, mm -hmm. I, I take it, but it is possible for them, uh, given the sufficient support and, uh, and appropriate projects to, to operate at that level. The other end of the spectrum is where the students are exploring and acquiring existing knowledge. Mm -hmm. We largely know what they're going to find, um, but it's new for them. So it's new for them rather than new for society. Mm. And that's traditional inquiry-based learning. Best examples of that, if you've got kids at infant school level, five, six years old, a lot of the teaching in uh, at least uh, some schools is based upon uh, doing very you know, small little projects, questions, uh, and, and doing it. They won't call it inquiry-based learning, but that's effectively what they're doing. Um, one of the problems I think we have in higher education is by the time the students come to us, they stopped asking interesting questions. <laughs> you know, if you've got five-year-olds and that, they're always asking questions. Um, Eighteen-year-old and that is, tell me the right answer, please. You know, it's that, is that sort of question, or is it on the test? Uh, uh, and I think that's a real challenge to get them to come up with interesting questions. And that's another reason I like that McMaster one. First thing they have to do in, in the first semester often is come up with a researchable question. Mm -hmm. and, and we know having a, a, a good question is the key to any good research. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, by the time they get to the final year and they're doing that capstone project, uh, they've got to come up with them. They've never been asked to come up with a question before. No wonder they struggle. <laughs> so I think they should do that in, in, in each year. Mm. Coming back to the diagram then, it's at the extreme end. Um, on the right-hand end, it's the elite model. But I would argue elite isn't that elite. It can be for many more than we give credence. On the left-hand end, it's for anybody. It's for everybody. Um, uh, and not restricted to higher education either. And, and it's, that's a fluid area between the two. Whatever project you do, even if you think you know the answer, the, they may come up with something you know, which is new and different anyway. Um, so what we mean by research and inquiry affects what you can do, what you think the potentials are. OK, dogs again. This is my first year slide. Now, all our three dogs have been through that training. Um, yeah, they're pretty good at sit, stay, heal. Not quite so good at always coming back. <laughs> um, particularly Tess now, she gets old. We, we talk about her going through her purple phase. Now she's 12 and a half. And Maggie Smith and her films, you know, she's uh, become a rebellion and you know, won't come back where she would before. And <laughs> we have to take her back to school. Um, but this is, I think, how we treat a lot of our first years. Um, uh, we tend to think of our first year courses, well, they come from different backgrounds. We'll get them all up to the same standard. I think we do a disservice to quite a few of our students, particularly actually some of the, the brighter students who have already, um, not necessarily brighter, the more interested students actually, who, who come in and think, great, we're going to higher education. They can get turned off by some of our first year courses. They find them a bit boring. Mm -hmm. We're not challenging them sufficiently. Um, and I think one of the challenges that we have is how we design first year courses, which are both challenging to some of our students, but also suitably scaffolded to bring other students who are uh, uh, at earlier stages uh, in intellectual development up. And it's, it's a bigger question. Um, what I want to show you now is, uh, at the first year level at least, some of the courses that we can do where we can actually challenge them right from day one. And McMaster was, was just one of those courses. I'm going to give you um, a choice this time. Time's limited. Um, if you're interested in looking at first year courses, there are uh, eight courses I've identified there, pages six to nine, starting with a, a number two. Or if you're more interested in the final year, the capstone uh, project level, um, there are a dozen courses there, which I have uh, examples there, pages 10 to 13. So first of all, decide which one you're most interested in. You've, you've got the whole lot anyway to take away uh, as a resource. Um, but in identifying one to skim read now and see uh, identified, choose which one and then one of those. But again, if you could check other people on your table, perhaps looking at different ones that you're looking at. So again, we cover a variety of them. Um, uh, I'll, I'll make it a little longer than five minutes now, so you can also you know, help yourself to a, a drink or stretch your legs if you want to, the, 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 as part of the uh, exercise. But in about um, you know, ten minutes or slightly less, uh, I'll, I'll just ask you, and we'll go through them first year courses and then final year courses again. Same question, which are the most interesting examples, or tell us about things you do in the first year or final year in your courses. Exercise clear? Yes. Good. Go for it. 